So welcome everyone. We are going to start this uh, discussion and launch. I am very glad to have here uh, Sarah, a national from Italy also. There are not too many around, so it's always a pleasure uh, to find people interested in a similar issue. And I am, uh, I should introduce myself, actually, I am Lia Shortino. I am the founder and director of C-Junction, and C-Junction is the place, you see, it's a public venue. We do all kinds of events, photo exhibition, painting exhibition as well, as panel discussion uh, related to Southeast Asia. So all the aspects of Southeast Asia, we have done quite a lot on Myanmar, uh, this last year because of the situation is quite worrying and it is key to the future of the region. So we have devoted quite a lot of intention, but also uh, Indonesia is another country we have had a number of events. And today we have something that kind of link Europe with uh, Southeast Asia. So it's quite interesting in relation to uh, media activism related to LGBTQI plus plus plus. Yes, I am also very glad to have Ajahn Sri Papa, an old friend. And finally, she made it to C Junction after various invites that could not uh, be because she's a very busy uh, person. So I will give the floor immediately to her and she will take over from now on. Thank you, Ajahn Sri Papa. Thank you so much, uh, Rosalia. Uh, good evening to all of you. Um, it's so nice of Sarah to uh, invite me to be here. Um, this is my first time to be at Sea Junction, as Rosalia uh, just mentioned. I was trying to, in the past, Rosalia, but it was not successful uh, due to many other commitments. Um, uh, first of all, I guess before I say any other things, I would like to congratulate Sarah. Uh, uh, for the book. Of course, before the book, it was her graduation. We, it was her you know, earning a, a doctorate degree, uh, which was a hard-earned degree. Um, Sarah had gone through many process. Uh, finally, she made it. So really congratulations, Sarah, um, for... For a very successful PhD, because Sarah is uh, one of a very, very few PhD students at the PhD program in Human Rights and Peace Studies at Maidon University, who actually passed her thesis defense without conditions. So, double congratulations, Sarah. <laughs> um, so, welcome you on to um, this um, book launch. I'm, I'm very happy uh, to be moderating the session. Um, before I, you know, introduce our speakers, I think we'll be waiting Henry Ko a bit. So I will start by Sarah asked me to um, say a few words about the um, human rights situation in South Asia. Um, I guess I would not go to that because it would be taking quite long, and we don't have much time because there's so much to say which come to the human rights situation, including the situation of rise of LGBTQI. But I just want to start by referring to a work, a very short paper of Sirin Lim. He wrote in May 2021 that the uh, internet has become as real as any social spaces we occupy in person. Um, and so much of our lives are integrated digitally now. Um, another another person who wrote in the same in the same um, uh, volume, and he happened to be my former student, uh, Joel Barredo. Um, he wrote that technology has been playing a critical role in shaping and undermining agency of LGBTQI and their capacities. Um, different platforms here, you know, why enable them, I mean, LGBTQIA, enable their ability to uh, express and connect this digital platform could be harmful. I think this was reflected quite well in Sarah's, you know, uh, uh, book. 
um, uh, disinformation, uh, hate speech, uh, misinformation in social media uh, result in discrimination, um, 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 homophobia, and trans transphobia. And I guess that's what we see not only in this region, but also in Europe. Um, we, we talk about ASEAN, Thailand, ASEAN, and Europe, uh, as uh, Rosalie just mentioned. I think it's very timely because all ASEAN leaders are now in Belgium having ASEAN EU meeting. <laughs> so we are here, you know, talking about LGBTQI in Italy, Thailand, and South Asia. Just want to say a few words about the book. Um, the book LGBTQI Digital Media Activism and Counter Head Speech in Italy. If someone can show the book, it's here. Um, so uh, you are invited to scroll through, of course. Um, yeah, the book actually investigates um, digital uh, media activism practices. And uh, it examines how Italian LGBTQI activists are championing um, social change uh, through nonviolent communications. So the book uh, analyzed um, if, and I think this was my imposition <laughs> to Sarah when she was preparing up her thesis. I was actually asking her because I was really wanting to know more. Uh, if legal means or law uh, really, you know, contribute to social change or to change the course of the rise of LGBTQI. Um, as I mentioned about Sarah's thesis, so this book is actually based on the, her PhD thesis, uh, which investigated uh, the complex uh, complexity and, you know, and uh, symbiotic uh, relationships uh, between media and movements, uh, particularly how Italian LGBTQI actors and activists express their digital media activism and uh, developing um, 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 changes, uh, strategies, and you know many other things. And as I said, I was asking Sarah to look because in 2016, right, Sarah. Um, Italian Parliament uh, came up with or adopted a law. So immediately I was encouraging Zara to look, as I said, if such law really contributes to any change in the rights, protection of rights of LGBTQI, um, or any change, institutional or structural change um, um, of the, you know, on, on the rights of, of, of LGBTQI. So that's about the book. I would I would really encourage you to you know, to read to go through. Um, it's a small book, but uh, heavy in content. I guess Sarah. So <laughs> heavy in content, not heavy in you know in. Um, I um, we are very privileged to have two speakers um, with us. Oh, by the way, Sarah, would you like to say anything? Oh. Um, no, I will go through the panel discussion and uh, explore a bit more about these issues. I okay. just wanted to thank you for joining us as the moderator today. It's a great honor for all of us to have you here. And uh, yeah, maybe we can introduce a bit our other two colleagues uh, here with us. Okay, all right. So in that case, I'll be introducing our two speakers. Um, one is a long time friend. I, I could not remember when I first met um, Emily. Uh, I could not remember because it has been quite some years <laughs> when you were doing the UPR. Um, so, Emily, as I said, uh, is a long time colleague in Penn, and she is currently executive director of Manusia Foundation. Manusia in Thai is actually referred to human beings. Um, Emily um, got her uh, master's degree in international relations from Japan, and he was doing a lot of works, including works with uh, um, UN agencies and Ministry of Foreign Affairs of France. Of course, you know, he has been here in, based in Thailand for, I don't know, again, Emily, how many years. Um, um, but, you know, uh, very knowledgeable when it comes to human rights. 
uh, in Southeast Asia, including, of course, right of LGBTQI and digital media. Um, just uh, last last month, I was inviting Emily to share her expertise on digital media and human rights with us. The second speaker for today is Henry Cole. Thank you, Henry, for actually making uh, time to be here in person. You know, um, you are right on time uh, because I was worrying that uh, someone joining online would be having a problem uh, because uh, of my experience yesterday organizing a hybrid conference and it was not working that well. So I'm so glad that you are here, Henry. Henry is, a, is the executive director of um, ILGA Asia. Um, Henry, you may be, uh, Ibka, you may be explaining a bit more. I was actually trying to Google, but uh, um, um, uh, since 2015, you know, Henry has uh, worked as the human rights specialist and the um, researcher with the UN agencies and uh, some NGOs. Um, Henry um, is a, actually is a lawyer. Uh, lawyer by training uh, from the UK. Um, he is um, um, also a musician. Um, I was surprised when I was looking at your... <laughs> um, um, Henry plays violin and piano. So, <laughs> um, so I think uh, this place is very right for you, Henry. All right. So um, I, I, um, I don't want any presentation if it is possible. But, you know, if necessary, then you, you can, especially actually painting, you know, the picture of LGBTQI in Thailand and in the region. And I think, you know, for that, uh, Emily would be a perfect person to do so. Uh, but before I go to Emily, I just want to come to Sarah. I would like to know, Sarah, because when we were discussing about thesis, you were actually wanting to work on the issue of migration, but then you changed the topic. So what actually motivated you to change the topic or to conduct research and finally write the book on LGBTQI? Yes, you're right to remind me this, Ajahn. Uh, when you are trained in human rights, there are too many topics to tackle of, and everything is so much of interest. But... Uh, Actually, um, I started to understand uh, that in Italy there were very pressing issues that do not get on the headlines. Migration is not one of them because, or negatively, or uh, positively, somehow migration is a buzzword in my country. But the LGBTQI rights, uh, not much. And the uh, human rights violations against LGBTQI people is a global concern, not just an Italian concern. However, in Italy, actually, we um, witness continuously discriminatory legislation, state practice, even the strong influence of the Roman Catholic Church is really posing a threat to LGBT people, and also the rising far-right political neo-fascist parties that <laughs> are taking power um, really are a threat with the anti-gender movements, uh, which I would love to learn a little bit more also from the Asian experience because anti-gender movements are very strong in Europe. Uh, and all these are really contributing uh, to um, a reality in which LGBT people are still very much silenced, marginalized, and also um, they are um, you know, they, they face many obstacles in exercising their fundamental human rights, including the freedom of expression, freedom to be who they are, freedom of identity, uh, freedom of opinion, freedom, freedom of assembly, you name it, so many. And, uh, and, that's, and, and that's what I started to see more and more, and I said, who's talking about this? Not many. But also what shocked me is that homophobia is the number one indicator of intolerance among the Italian population. And uh, um, the culture, maybe for some, this is the news, but Italy is still a country where a culture of don't ask, don't tell is very entrenched in the society. Uh, and also, according to several research, uh, the population, majority of the population said that if uh, um, for homosexuals it would be better to be in the closet, or uh, if homosexuals were more discreet, uh, uh, they would be better accepted by the population. 
But what is the problem here? There's no problem to be reserved. You know, I'm, I, I, I believe that everyone is free to be who they are and to portray themselves to the world in the way that they wish to be portrayed. The problem is that invisibility has always signified historically, but also in the present. Uh, invisibility has signified powerlessness for the LGBT community. And the reason why I wrote my little but heavy book uh, is because uh, I wanted to break the silence. I wanted to give voice to the Italian activists who are doing an amazing work in Italy, a work that is still very much invisible. And this work is not just invisible among the population or among uh, uh, the politicians. This work is invisible, believe it or not, also among the very diverse community of LGBT actors in Italy that are structured in different geographic locations, rural, urban, Icelanders, uh, and they don't know what everyone is doing. Uh, also, what gets through the headlines is the hate speech, is the, uh, the homophobia, is the politicians' hate discourses. But why not give light to the peace activists that are doing such a fantastic job? And that's why this is, I think, one of the first books dealing with the positive narratives, the achievements, uh, that, that the political and cultural resistance that is expressed through the digital media and other hate speech. So many motivations to write this uh, little but heavy book. Okay, so breaking the silence and making busy movies. Um, which is which is uh, an important one, and of course, um, I think what you think is important is that uh, we talk about human rights. We really look at negative side of it. So this book bring some positive insight to the QI movements at least in Italy. So I would like to ask um, Emily and Henry. Um, um, I guess you have been um, understand that you have been, of course, you know working not only on human rights in, in Thailand and in Southeast Asia. I wonder when you come to the rise of LGBTQI, if you see any convergence or divergence, you know, uh, when we talk about these issues um, in Thailand, Emily, and then Henry in, you know, Southeast Asia in general. Thank you so much, Ajahn Tipapa, for the question. Congratulations for your book, Sarah. Really good that you're Launched, that you launched this important book to portray positive narratives because that's really what is missing, I would say, around the world. Um, I in terms of similarity and convergence and differences between Italy and, uh, and Thailand, I think there are similarities but also differences. Unlike, um, I would say, like in Italy, uh, the people portraying a negative narrative against the LGBT community are the conservatives. So the older generation, the politicians in power, um, the royalists, the very conservative people. Where, meanwhile, most people coming to Thailand think that Thailand is the paradise for the LGBT community, right? Like you come to Thailand, you think like, oh, I'm gonna live in Thailand if I'm an LGBT activist, because here I can be, I can live free, I can be myself, I can express myself freely. So I would say from a younger generation perspective, per perspective, you would think that Thailand is a paradise. It's an LGBT paradise, and everybody can live freely. People don't are not um, uh, subject to don't say, don't ask, because they would uh, identify themselves more freely than in Italy. However, there's no legal protection. You know, there, there's a lack of legal protection for LGBT rights in the country. There's a lack of anti-discrimination policy or legislation, also covering the ground of LGBT uh, individuals. So really the issue that we are facing similar to Italy here, it's the fact that conservatives and older, older generation, old people uh, under the Buddhist pressure, you know, the Buddhist religion pressure, are actually treating LGBT individuals as second class citizen. And it was very, very visible at the end of last year, especially on 17 November 2021, when there was a constitutional court ruling that was very disrespectful towards the LGBT community. So there was a, a couple that challenged the civil code in Thailand, section 1448, which is uh, related to marriage. And the couple wanted the constitutional court to ask the constitutional court whether section 1448 is actually unconstitutional because it only recognized marriage between men and women. 
And the ruling of the Constitutional Court was so shocking because not only they said that, as, that Section 1448 is constitutional, so that a marriage can only be between a man and a woman, but on top of that, they went beyond, meaning most of the judges are old, sexist, patriarchal men. Huh? They went beyond the beyond uh, the, inimagin the imaginable. They basically, in the ruling, compared LGBT people to animals. So it was very disrespectful. It made a lot of young people angry. And definitely that's something that is very similar to Italy, right? How it's being, how the narrative and how policies are being shaped by conservatives while people on the ground and youth are asking for LGBT rights to be recognized, recognized as equal rights. Something that might be different from um, Italy is how we perceive women's rights here in the country. Uh, for us, you know, feminist, um, Manusha is an intersectional feminist organization. And like many other feminist groups, we see LGBT rights, including transgender women. So we see it as one, you know, one same fight. Uh, there's no distinction between um, women, lesbian women, and women from the LGBT community. It's one same fight, one same goal, because we want women's rights for all, including transgender women, uh, lesbian women, intersex women. So it's really and bisexual women. So it's really important to note that in, in, in Thailand, unlike in Europe or in Italy, the fight for gender equality and women's rights, it's a unified same fight because we see feminism from an intersectional lens. And I would say something similar is the civil partnership bill. So you know how in Italy you also don't recognize same-sex marriage? It's the same thing in Thailand. And like in Italy, the Thai government, because led by conservatives, is trying to push for the civil partnership bill, just like you have the civil union in Italy. Like, there was also the civil union in France before same-sex marriage was recognized. So the civil partnership bill is very problematic for groups like Manushaya, for most of the LGBT groups in Thailand. Why is it problematic? The narrative of the conservative government is that you should be happy that we are actually considering a bill for you LGBT people. What are you asking for more? Why do you ask for more? Not even ask for same-sex marriage. You should be happy with just the civil partnership bill. And that's a very wrong narrative, right? Because it's also being provided in the constitutional court ruling that was passed last year. The judges said, if LGBT people want rights, a bill should be passed for them, meaning the civil partnership bill. But you know, in Europe or in France, there was the PAX with civil partnership bill that was enacted not just for the LGBT community, it's because in France, most of the heterosexual couples don't want to get married. They don't necessarily believe in marriage. That's the reason why there was a civil union bill. The fact that the conservative government in Thailand or government officials or all generation LGBT activists are using France as an example is very wrong because they're totally not understanding what happened in Europe. So I would say we are experiencing the same thing as in Italy, where the government is only, only want to offer a civil partnership bill that actually treats LGBTI individuals as second-class citizens, not granting them exactly the same rights as any heterosexual couple. So they won't have the right to adoption, they won't have the same property management rights, and they won't have any right in terms of inheritance. So again, here in Thailand, LGBT people may be seen as living freely. You might think this is an LGBT paradise, but in reality, they are not being protected by the law, and they are being treated as second-class citizen, even in the bill that is being pushed forward by the government. Thank you, Emily. And I just want to maybe to add one sentence that actually the bill um, has been in the parliament for more than 10 years, um, still not adopted yeah, because of the conservative senators, actually. Yeah. Conservatives. Yeah. Uh, Henry. Uh, the the uh, picture in, in Asia, Southeast Asia, you see similarities in general? Thank you so much, Ajahn. And Dr. Sarah, congratulations on the new book. Um, I think I'd like to bring, I'd like to remind folks, I think on uh, 18th of June this year, um, you know, it marks the inaugural International Day for Countering Hate Speech. But what is also striking on that day is that it is also in the middle of Pride Month, right, in June. And I think it serves as a sobering reminder to the LGBTIQ community that violence, harassment, discrimination is still at large, um, affecting queer people in Asia. 
and particularly, I think, in the digital sphere. It's also worth noting that um, with respect to, the, to this in Southeast Asia, there are still uh, well, four countries now um, that still retain some form of criminal sanctions for consensual same sex, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, and Myanmar. Yeah, we... Singapore kind of like, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think in addition, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, online hate speech and violence against uh, LGBTIQ people have increased including places like Malaysia and Indonesia. Of course, I think that there isn't much uh, about Brunei, but I think we can draw the conclusion that religious fundamentalism also plays an important role in countries like Malaysia and Indonesia on how these things exacerbate. Um, and of course, I think further LGBTIQ people, especially trans women and uh, queer women are at greater risk as many experience uh, particularly severe forms of online violence as also has been reported in places like Singapore. Um, I'd like to also bring folks' attention on the issue that uh, I think Southeast Asia uh, queer communities are facing is uh, on how we come as a community on countering queerphobic hate speech. There, there is the aforementioned of states uh, should respond differently of hate speech, but what is happening in our region is also that there is a conspicuous absence of laws um, protecting LGBTIQ individuals from harmful expressions, including a total lack of uh, queer specific hate crime, uh, queer crime laws, and laws that criminally sanction expression inciting violence, hostility, or discrimination. Uh, thank you, um, Henry. I think what you said reminds me uh, one of my colleagues who, who, is, who is a law professor, and he was trying to push for the, redef to, for the redefinition of rape. Because usually rape in law refer to the rape, you know, um, of the of different sex. But then he was trying to actually to to redefining that rape also cover rape, you know, between the same sex, for example. Um, and uh, it was uh, quite hard actually, but I think he finally got it, um, in Thai law. Um, I I wonder because I think what you said that some there's some aspect of security. Do you see, you know, in your work, so in, you know, around South Asia in Thailand, do you see the, um, the biggest challenge, security challenges for LGBTQI, especially in digital media? Um, Emily? Thank you very much for the question. When it comes to Thailand, of uh, the LGBT community, first of all, Thailand does not criminalize hate speech. There's no specific law to criminalize hate speech, like in many other uh, Southeast Asian countries. And even in any other, like for example, in Indonesia, I may have an anti hate speech legislation, but because the LGBTI community is being criminalized, it can be applied. In Thailand, because hate speech is not being a crime, is not a crime, because the LGBT community is not legally protected. If an LGBT individual is facing hate speech, it, most likely they are not be able to seek a remedy or access uh, access justice. The also the second concern that we have in Thailand in terms of protecting um, an LGBT activist from facing hate speech. As an as an LGBT activist, how can you feel safe going online if you know you don't have any law to criminalize hate speech? That if you put yourself online, you might face hate speech. Secondly, your identity is not being protected and recognized. And thirdly, if you still do it, if you still go online and advocate for your rights and put yourself forward, then you're facing transphobic, uh, um, transphobic um, attacks. You know that you might not uh, get a remedy because the law does not protect you. So in terms of the first step in terms of security is to make sure that we have good laws for LGBT activists to feel safe to engage online. Last year, when Thailand was reviewed at one event human rights review on racial discrimination, the Thai government was asked about hate speech and how can people counter hate speech or when they're facing hate speech, how can they seek justice? And the Thai government said, you can use the Computer Crime Act or you can, or you know the Anti-Fake News Center was established in Thailand to counter hate speech, which is not true, right? Because the Computer Crime Act has been heavily misused and has been used as a weapon by the Thai government to attack activists and to attack pro-democracy activists. And in terms of um, the anti-fake news center, so when you are propagating, propagating fake news or misinformation 
towards the LGBT community and you want to report it to the Antifa News Center, the Antifa News Center is not going to consider it as hate speech. Why? Because the LGBT rights are not being protected in the country. So they would say the user has, a, has a exercised the freedom of speech. So that's really, really um, um, challenging when you don't have the legal framework to protect yourself, to feel safe. That's the first challenge. The second challenge in terms of uh, LGBT activists and security uh, measures that needs to be taken into account. To be honest with you, most of the LGBT activists are young people, right? And most of them are using social media or using internet to share their views. So I would say, I would celebrate the courage because they were able to gather so many people and they were able to be so good at sharing their views and at mobilizing people around the LGBT issues, but also around pro-democracy issues because they are brave. And even if they are facing trolling, and there is a huge impact on their mental health, um, on their mental health, they still push forward. And I want to tell you a story about the free youth hashtag that was uh, created in Thailand. Most of the people know the free youth hashtag as the pro-democracy movement, right? You all think that free youth is the pro-democracy movement. But the real story behind the free youth hashtag is actually a gay couple that advocated for LGBT rights in November 2019 in parliament. So it's James and Ford, or Ford and James. And Ford is the leader of the free youth movement, a young gay man. And in November 2019, he went to parliament with his boyfriend, James, and they advocated for same-sex marriage and for LGBT rights. And both of them, to make a point, they kissed in parliament. And they launched the free youth hashtag because they want to be free youth. And so it went viral, so viral that everybody started using free youth and as a result of that, Ford became also the leader of the free youth movement, the pro-democracy movement. So free youth, the pro-democracy movement was actually launched by, the, by an LGBT activist, a young gay man. So I just share this story just to, like, just to tell you that there might be security issues for LGBT activists because they're not being protected by the law. And even if they are facing um, hate speech, they won't be able to report it and they will have to deal with it on their own and face the mental health on their own because there's no support from the government. But as a collective, they do support each other. And as a collective, they are very, according to me, the LGBT youth are among the bravest and the strongest pro-democracy activists in Thailand. Thank you. Sarah, do you see the same thing in Italy? Yes, actually, what you were saying uh, resonated also our experience in Italy, because in um, just taking a reminder for the dates, that on the 27th of October 2021, they rejected the Arzan bill to prevent and combat discrimination and violence on the grounds of sex, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability. And this was traumatic because during the context of my research, and imagine this was a COVID pandemic ongoing where people couldn't gather on the streets. So their, their activism actually manifested mainly online, but maybe we can discuss about this a bit later. And uh, um, basically, the Senate just flunked this so important bill that would have protected not only LGBT people against homotransphobia, but also women, people with disabilities, and uh, you know all those who are the most uh, vulnerable to hate speech and hate crime. I also heard some challenging points of view of people who said that in countries like Thailand or other Asian countries, Having a um, criminal law uh, protecting hate speech could be backlashing because if uh, used by the wrong people to, um, you know, uh, to, to, to silence opposition, this could be very traumatic and also counterproductive. In our case, under recording and under reporting happens because there is no law in place. People don't know where to go because even though there are other institutions in Italy where we could report this kind of uh, hate speech and hate crimes. At the reality level, very few people are reporting because there's no, no institution in place to really take seriously account of this crime. So I see very big synergies, uh, unfortunately, with Thailand as well. Yeah, Henry, what about other countries in Southeast Asia when it comes to security challenges? Thank you so much, Ajahn. I think what Sarah just mentioned really struck a chord um, because I think also, not just in Southeast Asia, but uh, we realized in the larger Asia region, when you have vague and overbroad laws um, that are often enforced to arbitrarily restrict freedom of expression, 
So I think the issue over here is the caution in countering online hate speech must be exercised to avoid states um, overreach through countermeasures that may be too heavy handed, even though if they are well intended. Are you are you all saying that finally having laws or policies do not really contribute to protecting LGBTQI rights or making any change? First, we need a law that protects the rights of LGBTI individuals. Because as Sarah said, if you have, an, if you have a law that criminalizes hate speech, but you don't have a law that protects the rights of the LGBTI community, that law that criminalizes hate speech can be used against the LGBT community. So the first step is really to recognize the rights of the LGBT community, that the LGBT rights equal human rights. They're not asking for special rights. Right? They're just asking for equal rights. So I think all countries should have an anti-discrimination law that also would cover the grounds of SOGI, um, and that anti-discrimination law would also cover the rights of indigenous people and any other groups of the population that need to be protected against racial discrimination. That's the first step. And then the second step, it's also to have a law that criminalizes hate speech. Because in countries like Thailand and other Southeast Asia, like Emory said, you have cyber laws that are being misused, that are being used as weapons by the government to criminalize any dissenting voice or to, to shut down your freedom of expression. So it's very important to have a stand-alone anti-hate speech law that criminalizes hate speech with a clear definition of what constitutes hate speech because the Thai government likes to use broad definition or like to use national security you know, to protect itself or to condemn. So if you're an LGBT activist, and you are criticizing the way the government is uh, not respecting LGBT rights, and you don't have uh, any legislation that protects your rights, and you only have a head speech legislation, the government will, will, will misuse the head speech legislation, the anti head speech legislation, against the LGBT individual saying, you're talking or your action is against national security. So I would say it's challenging in Thailand and maybe in other Southeast Asian countries to have an anti-hate speech legislation because how it can be misused by governments, how it can, they can be used as another cyber law weapons against dissenting voices. So the first step is really protect the rights of the LGBT community, decriminalize homosexuality as the first step, and as the second step, enforce, enact and enforce anti-hate speech legislation that would protect all groups in, the, in society. Um, Sarah? I... Yeah, maybe just to add on what uh, Emily said, for me, I, based on the research that uh, I did, it was clear that uh, uh, hate cannot be eradicated by laws alone. There needs to be a very deep transformation of those institutions, social, cultural, political, and also those, uh, um, let's say, uh, those discourses that reproduce uh, violence. So. Um, Sometimes we feel powerless because we may not have a strong voice to make a change overnight about the law. The legal system is low, especially in countries like Italy. Uh, and uh, we cannot sit and wait. Okay, they rejected our bill, so what are we going to do now? And this is exactly the kind of digital media activism that I'm analyzing and exploring shows that there is a window of opportunity that laws alone will not eradicate hate. There are other um, restorative justice measures, such as reconciliation, um, uh, you know, erasing the stigma, um, policies on social inclusion, promoting a culture of human rights and peace. All this can be done bottom up and should not be disregarded as powerful means to change and counteract uh, uh, hate, I think. Um, Henry, will you have anything to add on this? Thank you. I just thought that among all of this background, I think the questions that we need to ask ourselves is also how should states protect LGBTIQ individuals, for example, uh, against an increasing proliferation of online hate speech? And I think the questions that we also have to be asking ourselves is what qualifies as a hate speech? What forms of hate speech should states prohibit? And what manner should prohibitions take place? Because this contribution seeks to address um, the questions and lay out a blueprint then for states to resp uh, its responses on the different forms of online hate speech. So uh, really my last question, what the roles that you know, finally grassroots uh, media activism um, play in um, LGBTQI um, 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 
movements advocacy and mobilization, Sarah. At least you uh, you see in Italy. Uh, for me, you mentioned a bit earlier. Yeah. Yes. I think that social movement. Uh, this is explored in chapter three of my book, which is a chapter for me is very important because it talks about the history of the LGBTQI movement. And in that history that you will read in many other books, very seldom the media activism is mentioned. The role of media activism in the rise of the LGBTQI movement or even before we're talking, you know, I will bring you through uh, the history of this movement. For me, social movements exist at the intersection of politics, networks, and media activism. No matter how we define this media activism, from the first radio, television, to the you know, cinema, or other expression of activism. In Italy, we ranked sixth in Europe as the people who use mostly social media. And while all activists recognize the importance of digital media, everyone reported, and we're talking about the main LGBT organizations in Italy, to not have a written formal communication plan or strategy, uh, or social media plan or strategy. And also they told me very bluntly, we never pay our communication work. Uh, we never budgeted in our financial plans, but we expect to do a little of communications here and there. So you see that there is this huge priority and huge realization of the importance of digital media activism and zero investment in doing such work, zero training. Actually, the only trainings that this organization attended was sponsored by ILGA Europe. So thank you so much transversally for that. Uh, but all of them agree that actually it is so important to develop these capacities to establish authority of the NGO, of the organization, both at national and transnational level, also to strengthen branding and identity of a particular campaign, of a particular program, of a particular project. They also said that having good social media and communication assets will really help them to become more credible. And this is important because NGOs like you survive on donations, fundraising, and it's very difficult in Italy to, for LGBT organizations to get funds. Let's not even mention the, tra uh, the, the, the trans organizations who are fa facing immense challenges and also feeling in conflict by being visible and at the same time having to be invisible to protect people like undocumented migrant trans sex workers uh, or uh, uh, others. So you see how challenging it is. Social media is also very important to build connections, uh, to get supporters, to get allies, to once again be able to do their work. <laughs> and um, during COVID, this was particularly evident that people got in touch with others transnationally, even if the English barriers are there because uh, Let's say that not everyone in Italy speaks uh, English and we face similar challenges maybe in Asia. Uh, so there is a big gap between the center and the periphery and those inequalities should be addressed. And last but not least, for us it's very important digital media to express authentic self-representations. We don't want mainstream television to define what is an LGBT person or subjectivity. We want to reclaim the pen, reclaim the voice, speak about ourselves only with our voice. And this is really what I think has empowered a lot of marginalized um, LGBT activists or individuals, especially those working on faith, religion, and homosexuality. Big group that is often invisible, but has done a fantastic work. So you can see that these are just some of the points I will discuss more in my book, but uh, maybe it's interesting to hear if they share the same views. Yeah, I, I, I wonder, actually the same question, but I wonder if, like in Thailand, in Southeast Asia, if finally media activism has been, I use the term taking for granted. Well, without social media and digital campaign, I don't think my Nunchia Foundation would be where we are now. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, when we opened in 2017, we were not on social media. We were always on the ground doing grassroots work, capacity building. We did not communicate about our work. COVID kicked in, right? 
with COVID, everybody turned into social media, especially in Thailand, because there was the pro-democracy movement, youth needed to be supported. We needed to tell the world what was happening in Thailand. So the hashtag, what's happening in Thailand, went viral. And we started using Instagram, Twitter more, Facebook more. We started, oh my gosh, we need to use social media. Why? Because if you're out of social media, you don't know what's happening in, in, in reality on the ground. If you don't use social media, you're totally disconnected from the realities on the ground, but also from the people who are making history at the present moment and in the future. We work a lot with young people. To be honest with you, in Thailand, we've, we've, we lost hope working with the older generation and the old people because we don't think that change will come through them, right? Change will come through the young people on the ground and the youth demanding changes on the ground. So social media is definitely a very powerful tool when it comes to tell the truth to power, when it comes to messaging and shape your own narratives. Before, uh, before uh, I would say before COVID, we saw a lot of NGOs or UN agencies or government uh, agencies having the financial means to use social media, having a clear communication plan uh, to be able to shape their own narratives. And I would say with COVID-19 and with the use more and more of social media and the rise of the multi alliance and, and LGBT activists also doing democracy activism at the same time, we realized that social media is free, right? If you want to launch a discussion on LGBT rights, if you want to seek support, you go on Twitter talks. At that time, there were Clubhouse as well. Clubhouse was very viral at the time when the government was trying to shut down Twitter and uh, some Facebook pages. So everybody turned into Clubhouse. And now everybody is still using Twitter a lot. Everybody is still using Instagram a lot. And a lot of LGBT campaigns are launched online. So if you look at uh, the use of change.org, the whole petition to support marriage equality one and is, was promoted through change.org. The whole website on 1448 to support marriage equality is also a digital campaign online. Um, digital media, digital activism became more and more important. And also, I would say the success the success of the LGBT community to not just work on LGBT rights, but to mainstream themselves. You know, before LGBT activists would be like, I'm an LGBT activist, I can only work for an LGBT organization. And so I think it's important for organizations like Manushia and like others, because we are embracing intersectionality, to understand that people from the LGBT community are not just good at advocating for LGBT rights. And so having an intersectional approach and having LGBT individuals working in different sectors of society, working on freedom of expression, working on business and human rights, working on climate justice, are also bringing the intersectional lens through the activism online because, you know, uh, LGBT rights are for all. And, you know, Audrey Lord said, your silence will not protect us. So when you have LGBT activists working throughout the human rights field, sharing supporting and be standing in solidarity with others. In return, you have others, people from the Muslim community, people from the climate uh, change uh, um, field, environmental activists, joining then the LGBT fight as well and speaking with LGBT activists, not for. So I would say digital media activism became viral in Thailand. It's very well used by youth and by LGBT rights activists. And again, your silence will not protect us. So it's very important for others to work with LGBT activists together and for the LGBT activists to going to keep being mainstream throughout um, society and the human rights field so that people can join the fight as well and so can we can achieve marriage equality one day in the country. Henry, do you have anything to add? Before that, I would just like to say that Yoga Asia is uh, one of the organizations that truly got inspired by Manusaya Foundation throughout COVID and it is true that it's very commendable on what um, an organization like Manusaya has done. Using the power of social media, digital advocacy to reach out, not just to, um, I think, the, your traditional demographic that you thought that, um, you know, you can, you can actually reach out more to people. Um, just drawing back on the experience of uh, what we did last year as an organization, um, Dr. Sarah was mentioning about uh, people working on LGBT and faith, for example. Um, well, Yoga Asia has been around, but for example, the topic on reconciling faith and queerness is something that is not just sensitive, but I think it's very hard for a lot of uh, LGBTIQ people. But finally, we started a podcast 
by doing that as well. And we thought that it is a better approach in a, in a softer way to merge religious experts, um, queers, uh, philosophers, uh, not philosophers, scholars, together during that period. And we started a podcast called LGBT and Faith. And the same time as well, uh, we kind of thought that, oh, okay, it garnered um, conversations that the organization and among our memberships have never heard before. And in our humanitarian program, we have a dedicated Afghanistan program. Um, it is a contentious time when you can't really reach out uh, or uh, feature uh, queer people who are still stuck in Afghanistan, for example. So what we did was we also started a podcast called Bridges of Hope, the Rainbow Refugee Podcast, speaking to people that we are in touch, queer refugees in Afghanistan, but bringing their voices out and they remain anonymous in that particular uh, sphere. Um, one other good example that I think was a little bit more poignant to our trans community was during uh, Transgender Day of Remembrance last year. Uh, same thing as well, of course, we have to um, you know, run like a digital advocacy campaign. So what we did was we selected um, different groups of trans folks, non-binary, trans men, trans women, uh, from across the four sub-regions that Yoga Asia covers, West, South, Southeast, and East Asia. Just coming together, and we call it a TDOR chat room series, um, having the trans queerlings coming together to share your life experiences during COVID. What are your challenges? And uh, what are some of the learning experiences that um, you, know, you could share with um, your other trans Asian queerlings that you cannot be meeting with each other during this period? Um, but of course, I think we have been hearing about, uh, you know, good examples on how the LGBTIQ movement and activists are able to use the power of social media uh, in our activism. But I also like to note, for example, Malaysia just went through our general election very recently. What we didn't realize was, um, I think it was a marginal win. Uh, the collision that was being led by the more conservative hardline Islamic party could have won this election. And a deeper study into it was that we thought that a more liberal democratic party is always uh, you know, winning uh, people in big cities in urban areas. But we didn't realize what happened was with PAS, for example, the, Islamic, uh, the, the, the conservative Islamic coalition, they are actually very active on TikTok. They are very active on Facebook stories and Instagram reels. And that is their way of getting to very young voters. And we are talking about demographics ranging from 18 years old to 21 years old. So I think it's also something that, uh, you know, is worth for us to think about. I'm very sorry. I need to backtrack a little bit also on um, Ajahn's uh, question much earlier, talking about what can grassroots activists do, right? This is not a story from Asia, but uh, from one of our partners, uh, Stonewall UK. Uh, some of you might have heard of this organization um, are based in London. They are the largest um, LGBTI organization based uh, in Europe. So they recently teamed up, I think, with uh, Vodafone Foundation and Gallup, and they came up with this app. It was just launched yesterday. It's called Zuteria. What happened was we talked about how we define hate speech, we define hate crime. So this app is starting in the UK first, and they are urging youth to, of course, download it. And the aim is to design to um, report incidences that will build a more accurate picture on what hate crime and hate speech mean to people who are being affected among our community. Data, basically. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, data. Very good. <laughs> oh, very good yeah. no, what I was saying is that uh, uh, I agree with my colleagues. I also want to just do a small remark. We cannot also fall into technological determinism. That means that we do not we don't need to think that uh, technology is the replacement of human advocacy. And uh, for me, technology is almost an empty container without good contents. And that's why um, only crafting good narratives, what Emily was mentioning, and using these narratives mainstreaming this narrative through digital media, we can have empowerment and use digital media as a tool for radical social change. But many people, and especially the youth, and this is why I think we need this intergenerational uh, communication between our generation that we are the new old and the young, because it's us uh, who have the responsibility, the ones who are born between the two epochs, 
uh, the digital natives and the ones who are still in the, the print uh, era, let's say, to instruct, teach, and educate youths on how to best use these digital media tools. And creating the valuable, empowering narratives is key, I think. Yeah, but well, finally, we come back to, I think, only to, to one sentence, that actually uh, media, including digital media, could be either shaping or undermining um, you know, the rise of not only LGBTQI. It really depends on how we use it. Yeah, I guess that would be the end of the panel. But uh, I would like to um, invite our audience, if you have any questions or comments, to our three speakers, especially the author of the book. We have, we have a bit of time. What time is it, Sarah? Well, as usual, it's seven. So we will take maybe a few questions before uh, going to have an Italian small reception outside, uh, and uh, that is offered by this event. So, and yeah. also we will have a, an opportunity to chat more informally. Without without book. any question or comment, I would not be allowing you to go to Italian reception. <laughs> Yeah. Please. Nada. Don't be shy. Thank you. Um, well, um, it's very really wishful conversation dialogue we all have for an hour now. And um, I don't know which part I'd like to add on, but I think uh, without digital media advocacy, I wouldn't come so far. I wouldn't have helped a lot of trans and intersex individuals reach out to just uh, access to justice, you know. I did a lot of work around research and human rights uh, corporate accountabilities when it's come to discrimination in the workplace. I, when Facebook still being friends <laughs> with a community to promote um, uh, their political correctness and human rights advocacy, we could reach out more and more uh, in terms of like, uh, digital um, advocacy until they change their mind to be focused on their um, revenues, then things uh, turn upside down. But it's allow us to also um, reach out to different diverse um, platforms like Twitter. I I uh, registered Twitter for like ten years ago, and I just recently used it because I lose hope in our uh, Facebook. Um, but in the meantime, I could say that uh, it's two sides of sorts. It helped me gain um, visibility in terms of like my advocacy, but at the same time, it's turned back to me, you know, like I got slapped. Exposing you. Yes, it's exposing me as well. And um, <laughs> yes, so um, it can be used as a tool for a lot of slap cases, not only for LGBTIQ, but I think in terms of uh, uh, business uh, arena. And when I promote uh, LGBT inclusion, instead, um, I, yeah, like that slap. And it's still kind of like shaking a little bit because uh, on 21st, I'm going to the court hearing to, to hear that the court will dismiss or accept um, the slap. So it's kind of like um, hold me for a while. There are a few cases in my hand. I'm not even there to to share, to mobilize because I'm afraid that it's going to not only bring another slap case to me, but to also my clients, to also the my uh, organizations. And without uh, concrete uh provisional protections to, to ensure that we can walk home more and more because Thailand has been named as um, the paradise. It's kind of like we live in the frozen world. We've been freezing with this term for too long. I remember when I, from the, um, from the digital advocacy to the offline advocacy, I, in the past, I was invited to join many events when they speak about Thailand, people didn't pay attention at all. Just like, oh, mm, yes. And no one come to talk to me. Because they don't believe what I say. 
They don't believe what in Thailand? Are you are you joking? But the more we try to work, the more obstacle we we can see. But I try to look at the bright side that the slab or the other challenging that uh, our our friends and folks, for example, they are uh, pro democracy activists. Majority of them are LGBTIQ activists. And they are digging down into the root cause. That's why the state is now looking as as the 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 one of the 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 the, the enemies of the state. So I try to think that oh we are on the right track actually. We let them know. I remember when we the the last coup eight years ago, um where we're still marching and then instead of being uh uh facing uh um uh, violence against uh, our move, our march by the states, they actually help organize. What a shame when I think of that. Now things, things change. And I, I, I believe that because of the um, digital media activism that we have been created and built social, uh, uh, built a social movement together, we will reach to the point that um, it will also show to people in, in it also show to public, so they will understand that in this country or in the future, if we could reach to uh, a fair um, social justice and democracy, they will remember our name. They will remember our face. That this country has been built because our uh, LGBTIQ contribution. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think the space. Thank you very much for your uh, sharing. You actually remind me in, um, I cannot remember if it was 2006 or 2008, a friend of mine from Australia who is actually academic, you know, actually part of LGBTQI. He came to different universities in Bangkok, um, trying to convince them to organize, to help him organize an international conference for the first time to discuss about sexuality, LGBTQI, LGBT by the time, yeah, QI were not yet there yet. And no one accepted uh, to, to, to actually co-organizing the event with him. Then he came to me and I said, why not? Because that is part of human rights. So we organized, uh, it was a huge event of about almost 1,000 participants, about 80, 90% of them are actually, you know, were actually LGBTQI. And I got criticized for organizing that conference. And one of one of uh, uh, the one of the, the criticisms was that there might be something wrong with Zebra Park. I said nothing wrong. I think I was doing very right thing and trying to righting the wrong by actually contributing to the organization of international conference. And it was it was making headlines throughout the country by the time. And you know, of course, for about one or two years, criticism was still going on against Zebra, who actually organized that conference. And and as you as I think a few of you mentioned that Thailand has been seen as a paradise of you know of 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 our colleagues the uh, LGBTQI, but in reality we know what kind of challenges they are facing or you are facing, you know, in our society, which is so exclusive. I think I think I think inclusion and exclusion you know, is 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 really important because because we want to build uh, an inclusive society, but at the same time we are exclude we are excluding many people, including LGBTQI. I guess that would be the end. The key is really inclusion, um, empowerment, and you know, solidarity, which I feel that's really you know the thing that we we have we have to you know we have to 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 stick together in order to support each other. I guess with that again, Sarah, congratulations, and I would like to thank all speakers. Yes, I, contribution. I also want to thank uh, Emily and Henry. Uh, we, it's the first time we meet, actually, but you see how 
synergy, solidarity, people working for the same shared goal, we click like this. And I also wanted to make an announcement that for those who are interested in the book, we have five, only five limited edition copy on site. <laughs> so anyone who's interested, you can reach out to me. And also uh, the book is available on Amazon, on Book Depository, Google Play, everywhere. Uh, because of the publisher Rootledge. So I, we put some QR codes at the registration table in case anyone is interested to have the ebook uh, or they will ship the printed edition to Thailand without any problem. Um, again, let's meet for a friendly drink and uh, Italian food outside and uh, enjoy our networking. Uh, and uh, Rosalia, last word to you, maybe. Well, back to Rosalia, but she's quicker to take the... But yes, I normally I just thank the speaker for coming and of course Ajansi Papa for being here. I think uh, what we have seen is the double-edged sword of in C Junction, we believe in both. I think in-person interaction is remain a key to building uh, movements and uh, we will continue to do both. I think is uh, like Sarah and not, uh, we have seen in Europe that actually the social media have brought a lot of conservative uh, thoughts and I am not sure we are doing much better. Another question I had, but unfortunately the time was whether we should focus more on uh, having regulation for all these social media owners who are really determining what is good and what is wrong, uh, not so much the country law, but really go law to regulate the private sector. In this case, the owners of uh, such social media who seems to have really a disproportionate amount of control. But this is for a next discussion, I suppose. For now, please go ahead. Indeed, we are lucky to have some Italian food by Luca. If I can, what is the official name of the La Bottega di Luca, so in case you want to try later on uh, some more <laughs> of his uh, food. And please, since we are an organization who, like Sarah say, need also funding to continue our activity, give a donation on your way out. And I also want to signal on the 16th, we will have a documentary on Myanmar, on what is happening in Myanmar. Uh, it's a little bit dark documentary because he talk about disappearance and torture and other, uh, but six o'clock on the 16th. Thank you again for coming and please enjoy the food. <laughs>